The way Jeff was raised had a dramatic impact on how he related to people. That's my biggest takeaway. What a difference could have been made if Jeff had been loved. I really think that Amber was psychopathic or sociopathic and she found a fall guy to take care of what she needed to have taken care of. She wanted that money. She probably at that age had issues with her mom like a lot of girls do. And so she convinced him to do it. It's a perfect storm of two damaged personalities coming together to feed off of each other to violent ends. Jeffrey Ayers and Amber Bray dreamed of a life together, but their horrible nightmare led to the callous and senseless murder of Amber's mother, Dixie Hollier. They'll both spend the rest of their lives in prison. I'm Tamron Hall. Thank you for watching Someone They Knew. Anna Mariah Mo Wilson was a professional cyclist, one of the fastest women in the world on two wheels. In May of 2022, she was staying with a friend named Caitlin Cash in Texas before a big race. While she was there, she also spent some time with a man named Colin Strickland, who is also a competitive cyclist. At the time, Colin was living with his girlfriend, Caitlin Armstrong. On May 11th, Colin picked up Mo on his motorcycle and they went swimming. Later that night, Mo was found by her friend, Caitlin Cash, dead from multiple gunshot wounds. Police interviewed Colin Strickland, Caitlin Cash, and Caitlin Armstrong. They have filed murder charges and tonight, they are searching for an alleged killer who has fled Texas. Tonight, we take a look at the suspect, the motive, and the nationwide search for a fugitive. I'm Vinny Politan. Great to have you with us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And uh, we're going to dive deep into this story. It's incredibly tragic, but it is still an active investigation and a search for an alleged killer. I want to begin tonight. You know, if you've been watching me for years, that as uh, when I was growing up, addicted to court TV, not to, well, not court TV, crime shows, cop shows, detective shows. And, and one thing was always very common, right? When the detectives are investigating the case and you're trying to figure it out, the other detectives are like, like, like what's your motive? What's your motive? What do you got for a motive here? It's, it's such an important question. And, and when I got to court TV, and started covering um, trials around the country. Two things about motive. One, I know as a prosecutor, you don't have to prove it, right? But it's so important. It is so important a motive because it, it uncovers so much about a case, right? You're trying to figure out, well, who would want this person dead? Why would they want them dead? And you've got to peel back the layers of their lives to figure out exactly what was going on. Who were the people connected to the victim? And, and do they have a reason for taking that life? Now, there are classic motives that we see all the time. The first one, it's all about the Benjamins, right? We're, we're talking about money. Money is a motive. I've seen it many times on, on Court TV, whether it's an insurance policy, business partners, or just a, a, a plain robbery. You, the, the motivation for the murder was monetary, to get your hands on some money. And it's an old motive, but it's very persuasive inside a courtroom. Extremely persuasive and very common. The other one, even more common here on Court TV. It's all about relationships. And someone is cheating on someone. And that cheating heart uh, breaks another heart and someone lashes out. Sometimes the person who is cheating is the one who has to, okay, I'm in, I'm in the middle of all of this. I've got to get rid of one because I want to be with the other. Sometimes 
It's, it's the person who's being cheated on that gets angry and bitter and, and may go after the lover or may go after their own spouse or partner. Seen it so many times on court TV. It's an old motive. Again, extremely persuasive in the courtroom because people understand it, they can relate to it, and we've seen it so many times. And as we begin tonight talk, talking about what happened to uh, Mo Wilson, let's talk about this love triangle that was taking place. You've got three people involved, right? You've got the, the murder victim, Mo, Mo Wilson. You've got Caitlin Armstrong, who has a boyfriend named Colin Strickland. And is Colin connected to both women? Yeah, well, he's Caitlin's boyfriend, but he also had a relationship with the victim here. Talk about motive. Talk about a reason for taking another life. Not that it's a justification, but it's to get you inside the mind of a killer and, and try to prove that someone had a reason to commit the murder, had opportunity to do it, and you've got the evidence to back it up. So let's learn a little bit more about this story. Joy Lim Nakrin, Court TV legal correspondent, has the story for us tonight. Nice work, guys. Come on. These cyclists working their way up the hill are participating in Gravel Locos. A 150-mile gravel bike ride located two hours outside of Austin is where Anna Mariah Wilson was headed on May 14th. After just two seasons, she rose to the top of both mountain and gravel racing in the nation. She had kind of just started being at the top level. And at 25 years old, for sure, her career was just getting started. But that promising future was cut short. Mariah Wilson was found shot to death a few days before that race. On May 11th, 2022, Mariah passed away in Austin, Texas, while she prepared to compete in the Gravel Locos bike race. Now cyclists have gathered to remember the rising star, holding a short ride in her honor. According to court documents, officers responded to a residence where Wilson was observed lying on the bathroom floor, covered in blood. She was later pronounced dead. Investigators think she may have been the victim of a jealous rival. Wilson had dated pro cyclist Colin Strickland, who, according to Wilson's friend, had an on-again, off-again relationship with another cyclist, Caitlin Armstrong. Police reports state that Armstrong had discovered Strickland was having a romantic relationship with Wilson, even though Armstrong and Strickland were still dating. Armstrong was so angry, Armstrong wanted to kill Wilson. Strickland, in a statement to an Austin American statesman reporter, said he only dated Wilson a week or so before he and Caitlin reconciled their relationship, though he says he continued to see Mo at cycling events and in public settings. Armstrong, who was interviewed by police, rolled her eyes in an angry manner at this. On the day of Wilson's death, Strickland confirmed they were together swimming at a local pool and later grabbed a bite to eat. Armstrong, on the other hand, was not seen with Wilson that day, but the car she drives, a 2012 Jeep Grand Cherokee, was captured on surveillance footage at the house where Wilson was staying. In her police interview, Armstrong made no effort to deny this and provided no explanation as to why her vehicle was there. Partway through this interview, Armstrong requested to leave and was allowed to do so. The suggestion that Wilson may have been part of a love triangle prompted the family to state that she was not in a relationship at the time of her death. But that has not stopped investigators from charging Armstrong with first-degree murder. We're here today to say that the violence that took the life of Mo was not okay, and we are not okay. Armstrong is considered a fugitive and is wanted by police. U.S. Marshals have tracked her movements from Austin to Houston to New York and are still looking to confirm her location. We're searching to find out where did she go when she landed in New York. From that point is, is the unknown right now. Her father has not heard from her, but still believes her innocence. We would like to be left to be able to focus on Caitlin's safety and proving her innocence. Love triangle. That's what we're talking about here. And, and you've got a suspect, someone investigators believe is responsible for this murder, who has fled. We're going to talk about the, the search a little bit later in the program, but I want to begin on what happened in Texas. So I'm going to bring in Core TV field producer, 
Adrian Luis, who is joining us tonight live from Los Angeles, California, who was on the ground uh, taking a look at everything in this case. Uh, great to see you, Adrian. Um, off the top, I wanted to focus on these relationships because I think it's really the key to understanding this case uh, and understanding the evidence and everything else. Um, I was reading the affidavit and application for arrest warrant. I want to put it up on the screen because I think it's pretty significant when it talks about Colin Strickland, the man in the middle of this triangle. Um, Strickland advised he currently lives with his girlfriend, Caitlin Armstrong. Strickland stated they had been dating for approximately three years, but briefly ended their relationship for one to two weeks, just one to two weeks in October of 2021. Um, during Armstrong and Strickland's breakup, he met the victim, Mo Wilson. Wilson and Strickland then had a romantic relationship before Strickland ultimately began dating Armstrong again. Okay, Adrian, this, uh, this sounds just a little bit too much like uh, Ross on Friends, that they were, they were on a break when, when all this happened. W what were you able to find out about the relationship and... and and how truthful folks think uh, Colin Strickland is being about the nature of his relationship with the victim here. Well, Vinny, according to that same affidavit for an arrest warrant, you'll also see that an anonymous caller called into police and talked about what Caitlin had told them back in January. And that was that, and that was that she had received information that Colin was in fact not just seeing herself, but was seeing Mo at the same time. And this anonymous caller went on to say that this infuriated Caitlin and caused her to state that she was going to kill Mo. So what you're saying is, while well, Colin is back with Caitlin Armstrong, she finds out and, and suspects that something is going on. Now, Mo Wilson doesn't, she lives in San Francisco, doesn't she? I mean, she's not from the same she place. Does. So this is, how much time do we think that they could have potentially been spending together, uh, Anna Mariah Wilson, also known as Mo, and, and Colin, um, if they're in, you know, living in different places? Well, Colin stated that he had seen Mo in public settings. He had also stated to police that when he was seeing Mo for about a week or so, this was back in October, November of 2021. And then when Caitlin, according to this anonymous caller, had found out about um, his relationship with Mo back in January of this year, it seemed to have continued up until May of this year when uh, Mo was found shot to death in a residence in Austin, Texas. We, we have a statement here from Colin Strickland I want to show everyone uh, from reporter Tony uh, Pliteski. After our brief relationship in October of 2021, we were not in a romantic relationship, only a platonic and professional one. It was not my intention to pursue along an auxiliary romantic relationship that would mislead anyone. In now, I want to put up on the screen something else from the application uh, for the arrest warrant and the affidavit, which really is interesting when you, when you put it in context with uh, the statement from Colin saying that he doesn't want to mislead anyone. Strickland advised he stopped his motorcycle and sent a text message from his phone to Armstrong at 836. This text message stated the following, and this he's sending to his girlfriend, right? Uh, to Caitlin. Correct. Hey, are you out? I went to drop some flowers for Allison at her son's house up north and my phone died. Heading home unless you have another food suggestion. Um, he basically lied about his whereabouts to Armstrong to hide that he was actually with Wilson. So while he's not misleading anyone, he's misleading Caitlin. And Vinny, this actually um, plays into the timeline of things where when he was texting Caitlin, he was on his way home. And then after he arrived home, Caitlin arrived home after him, but it was her 2012 Jeep Grand Cherokee that seemed to be spotted at the residence that Mo was staying at at that time. So he drops her off, it's a, it's a motorcycle date, right? Picked her up on the motorcycle? Yes. 
drops her off, and then I guess he's got to pull over to the side of the road, do a little texting to the to the girlfriend that I live with to try to cover my tracks. Oh yeah, my phone died. Um, there's there's a lot of problems here with. You know, you're investigating a case, you need everyone to kind of tell the truth about what's really happening. And I don't know if that's necessarily happening. Um, Adrian, um, you were there. How did this impact the community and, and the families? I and mean, this is a horrible murder. Well, the Austin cycling community is certainly a very, very tight-knit community, Vinny. They uh, seem to all hang out at the same spots, attend the same races, and really encourage each other to get better at their craft. And upon hearing about Mo Wilson's death, they put together a short community ride and memorial to memorialize her. And at this memorial, they certainly spoke about her achievements in the gravel racing scene and how she was on her way to becoming one of the best cyclists in the country. And then they uh, put together a short ride that ended up at the pool where she was last spotted with Colin Strickland. And when you were on the ground there in Texas, was there anything that really surprised you? Or, or you're like, wow, how about that? I, I wasn't expecting that. Sure. Um, it was not on my radar that the Austin cycling scene was such a big deal in the country. It is where Lance Armstrong is based and that's where he, nearby where he grew up. And he also started a, um, a local bike shop and cafe where cyclists would attend. It is um, certainly also, Austin is a beautiful place for cyclists to ride. There are various terrains that they can, um, I guess, cover. And um, I guess going back to what I said before, the cycling community is so welcoming and so encouraging, and that is what has allowed it to grow um, so much in Austin. Final question, because everybody's thinking it right now. You just said the name Lance Armstrong. The suspect in this case, Caitlin Armstrong, both cyclists. Is there any connection between those two? Not that I'm aware of any. Okay. I didn't think so, but I just wanted to make sure. Adrian uh, Luis, uh, thank you so much. Uh, great to see you. Thank you for that reporting. I want to bring in our next guest joining us in Middlebury, Vermont, is the editor of Vermont Sports and Vermont Ski and Ride magazine. Lisa Lynn uh, is with us tonight. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you're in Vermont. What is the connection here? And, and I want to talk about the victim in the case. Um, what's her connection to Vermont? So Mariah Wilson was a Vermonter through and through. She grew up in the Northeast Kingdom, which is a beautiful rural area, northeast corner of Vermont, you know, bordering on Canada. Her father taught at the Burke Mountain Academy. He was a former um, Olympic ski racer, I'm sorry, Olympic caliber ski racer. He raced on the World Cup and probably could have gone to the Olympics. She grew up in just this outdoorsy, very tight community. There were only about 200, I'm sorry, 2,000 residents in Burke. And it's also home to Kingdom Trails, which are fantastic mountain biking trails. And those were her playground. That's her with her uh, bike when she was seven years old, and she and her brother Matt would go out and ride the trails, and they would also, you know, train and compete in skiing. In fact, she was an extremely good ski racer, and in high school was, I think, third in the nationals. And she probably could have gone on to be an even better ski racer, but she suffered two ACL injuries. Still, she was very determined. I talked to her, one of her coaches for our story in Vermont Sports Magazine, and he said that he would take his uh, kids, boys and girls, out for training rides, and Mo would outpace him and most of the boys. Uh, unbelievable photographs uh, uh, that we have uh, that you're sharing. Um, let me ask you, Lisa, um, how's her family doing? This, I mean, the prime of your life, she's, you know, just doing so much and, and really like on her way to great things. Uh, how are they holding up these days? I think it's just been an incredible blow to all of them. And I must say the, the one thing which I really took away from speaking with her family 
was that she really was the product of amazing upbringing. You know, her parents really encouraged her. I think, you know, she went to Dartmouth, she graduated with an engineering degree, and she said to her mom, I want to go be a professional cyclist. At the time, she had not been competing. You know, it's a little bit like somebody saying, you know, I've been running 10Ks and I want to go out for the Olympic marathon. And her mother, Karen Wilson, to her credit said, great, I believe in you, I'm supporting you, and I'm connecting you with a coach. And literally two years later, Mariah Wilson was close to the top of the world in terms of gravel riding. Again, it's sort of like somebody running 10Ks and then jumping in winning the New York Marathon. It, 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 using that term, what, what, what exactly is, is it a different type of bike riding? Can you describe it for the folks at home? And for me, so, uh, <laughs> Mariah was very good at pretty much every sport. Um, she grew up mountain biking, which is basically, you know, taking big knobby tires and going off road on all sorts of technical trails. And she was also getting to the top of what's become a very competitive arena, which is called gravel riding. And gravel riding can be anything from riding, you know, gravel roads to really riding very tough off road conditions. And the races she was competing in were 100 miles or longer. They often involved crossing streams, uh, going up mountains, coming down very loose dirt and gravel and rocks. And she was just had an unbelievable endurance. I think she first rose to prominence when she was second in the Leadville 100. That's a 100 mile mountain bike race in Colorado. Really an amazing, amazing young woman. We talk about Dartmouth Engineering School. And, oh, I want to be a professional cyclist. And boom, she's a professional cyclist doing uh, amazingly uh, an incredible loss. for. She was also just a nice person. Of course. Of course. One of the things that struck me was after one of the races that she did. I'm sorry. We have a little delay, but go ahead. After one of the races ahead. that she did. She, was, uh, she finished second, and she came back after showering and waited for the very last racer to finish at 11.30 p.m. at night. Amazing. Lisa Lynn, editor of Vermont Sports Magazine, appreciate your time tonight. Great reporting on this, and uh, we'll keep in touch because we're going to stay on top of this story because there is still a suspect on the loose uh, that needs to be brought to justice. Thank you so much. When we come back, folks, we're going to take you to the scene. We're going to take a look at the evidence. We're going to bring in our investigators. Do they have enough to prove that Caitlin Armstrong is responsible? How does it all line up? What is the timeline? You'll find out when we come back.
where your hard work pays off. We're here in memory of Mo Wilson, a professional gravel and mountain bike racer. Uh, she had kind of just started being at the top level and at 25 years old, for sure, her career was just getting started. So it's so tragic for her to be taken from us so, so early in her life like that. That was one of the cyclists at the memorial for Mo Wilson, who was gunned down. Now, investigators suspect um, her friend's girlfriend. And again, the exact nature, maybe it's her ex, boyfriend's. Girlfriend, however you want to say it, there was some sort of love triangle going on here. What I want to do is walk through the timeline here so you have a better idea of what happened at exactly what point. Because investigators uh, released a lot of this information. We went through the court documents, uh, the affidavits, etc. So let's begin May 11th, 2022, 5.45 p.m. Colin Strickland, the man in the middle of the triangle, the love triangle, says that he picked up Mo Wilson, the victim... Uh, from Cash's house. Cash is Mo Wilson's friend that she was staying with. Her first name is also Caitlin. Ten minutes later, Caitlin Cash receives an electronic door notification that the door is locked. So we believe that is the time that um, Mo leaves with Colin on his motorcycle. 8.16 p.m., Strickland and Wilson, Colin and Mo, leave the parking lot of Poolberger on Strickland's motorcycle. So Colin's got the motorcycle, Mo is with them. 816, they're leaving after having a burger, after going swimming. 10 minutes later, Caitlin Armstrong, again, this is Colin's live-in girlfriend. Her vehicle drives northbound on Maple Avenue and then westbound on East 18th Street. Nine minutes later, Colin Strickland, on his motorcycle, drives northbound through the alleyway north of East 18th Street. Now the key times, 836. The unique code given to Wilson is used to unlock Cash's door. That means Mo Wilson has now made it back to the house that she is staying at, at 836. A minute after Strickland drives northbound through an alleyway. 837. One minute later, Caitlin Armstrong's vehicle appears to stop at Caitlin Cash's residence. That is the home where Mo Wilson was staying, where she had just been dropped off minutes before, minutes before, by Caitlin's boyfriend, Colin. <laughs> Let me bring in tonight's guest to help work through some of the evidence in this case. Joining me in Atlanta, Georgia, former special agent in charge from the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, Trabor Randall. In Salt Lake City, Utah, private investigator Jason Jensen. And in Los Angeles, California, forensic psychiatrist, trial expert witness, and columnist Dr. Carol Lieberman. Before I get to my investigators, Dr. Carol Lieberman, talk to me about jealousy, about cheating and 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 how we go from that to a potential motive for murder well uh, at the center of this and i actually thought about the friends episode as well but um he is a lot more uh, uh much more of a liar whereas ross wasn't um he was just kind of caught in a bad situation but Colin is obviously in the middle of this. He lied to both of the women at different times. He lied to Caitlin that night, uh, talking about he was going to bring somebody flowers and so on, and his phone supposedly died, although then he texted her, so that didn't make any sense. And, um, and she apparently didn't trust him. I mean, she had found out earlier that he had seen uh, Mo, and he, she didn't believe him that night. So she must have been following them, or else she couldn't have gotten to the house a minute later. You know, it wasn't that's not a coincidence that she was there one minute later. And then poor Mo, 
Um, first of all, I think that Colin is trying to sort of uh, minimize what their relationship was. You know, oh, it was only for a week, and then you know, then after that, it was platonic. Well, clearly, Mo didn't think it was platonic, and I know that her family gave this statement and saying that she really wasn't in a relationship, but she, you know, in her from her texts. Uh, apparently she thought she was. So he was juggling both of these women at the same time. And as often happens, you know, although unfortunately not not often murder, but um, the two women, you know, c came in clash, ha had a, a clash and, and um, and Caitlin was, you know, trying to, I mean, the interesting thing, one of the interesting things is that there were multiple gunshots. So she was really angry. Now she had been in a relationship with him for three years before this. Um, so, you know, she, and then they had their break and then, you know, and then, and then um, Mo went back to California and then when he saw her again, so he was seeing her, he saw her at cycling events, he was continuing. I don't believe that it was just platonic. He was continuing a relationship all along and Caitlin Caitlin suspected that. So because that just shows all the fury, all of these multiple gunshot wounds. Absolutely. Trevor Randall, getting back to the timeline now. Uh, Dr. Carol Lieber makes a great point. Do you think that that day that it is, po it is possible that Caitlin Armstrong was following Colin and Mo on that motorcycle? Or is there some other way that she could suddenly or her vehicle suddenly show up? just like a minute or two after she gets home. I think there's a strong chance that they were being followed without knowing it. Uh, certainly in this day and age, uh, you know, regular civilians have have gotten wind to all these different devices you can use now uh, to track uh, your family members uh, movement. Uh, most of the time the products are marketed for legitimate reasons, but oftentimes they're used um, in cases like this where you have the jealous uh, lover, if you will, or worse, uh, someone who may be a sexual predator. But I certainly think uh, she knew exactly what was going on. You know, and unfortunately, she was just waiting for the right moment uh, to take action. We've seen this any number of times when you have these, um, you know, sort of love triangles, we call them, um, that that go sideways. Uh, I would venture to say it probably, would, probably wasn't the first time something like this had happened, that she even had a need to uh, feel like she wanted to follow them or follow her boyfriend to see if he was being faithful to her. Jason, Jensen, I want to put something else up on the screen here from the affidavit um, for probable cause involving firearms. Another big piece of the evidence in this case. Strickland, again, Colin Strickland admitted to purchasing two firearms approximately between December of 2021 and January of 2022. That is after this little um, we were on a break moment, right? One for himself and one for his live-in girlfriend, Caitlin Armstrong. Strickland advised that he purchased a Springfield Armory handgun for himself and a six-hour handgun for Armstrong, uh, six-hour P360. I know nothing about guns, uh, by the way, uh, so I may be not pronouncing this correctly, but the six-hour P365 9-millimeter belonging to Armstrong, which was recovered from Strickland's resident, residence, was test-fired using laboratory ammunition. The fired test cartridge was compared microscopically to the shell cases located next to the body. Uh, Nibbin investigative lead was developed through the uh, correlation review of ballistic evidence. The potential that the same firearm was involved is significant. So Jason Jensen, here's where I want to leave this. You've got the gun, but whose hand was it in? Was it in Colin's hand or was it in Caitlin? If this is the weapon, I mean, he bought it. He said he bought it for her, but that's based upon what he's saying. Right, right, yeah. I mean, definitely both had access to those guns. Certainly, uh, Strickland is familiar with the Six Hours, so you, you, you have to ask yourself from a defense perspective, was this uh, a, a weapon fired by uh, Armstrong or was it fired by Strickland? And is this a, an attempt to blame Armstrong for the murder where Strickland could have been guilty of it? But it seems like all the other evidence seems to be piling up on Armstrong otherwise because she had a clear opportunity to explain why her Jeep was there and some other significant situations and she refused to answer. So it definitely sounds like 
she's hiding, you know, failing to reveal some innocent reason why her Jeep was at the residence. And we do know Strickland was operating his motorcycle. So chances are he wasn't driving a motorcycle and trying to drive a Jeep at the same time. Yeah. And another big aspect of all of this, she fled. She's in the wind. She is wanted tonight. I want to thank Dr. Carol Lieberman for helping us out tonight. We'll see you again real soon. Uh, Trabor, Jason Jensen staying with us as we take a look next at the search for Caitlin Armstrong. Plus, coming up next hour. In New York, New York, Amber Heard sits down for her first interview since losing her trial to Johnny Depp. In part of that interview released today, Amber Heard talks about the jury who didn't believe her when she testified. And I thought he was punching me. I felt this pressure. I felt this pressure. Tonight, we take a look at Amber's reaction to the jury who awarded Johnny Depp $15 million.
Rock from Force Factor. So that travel actually took place on May 14th. Uh, she was depicted on surveillance uh, camera there at uh, the Austin airport uh, around lunchtime, about 12.30 p.m., uh, boards that flight. Uh, and that was, remember, that was two days um, after she was questioned by police, three days after the homicide occurred. So at this time right now, uh, when she's seen on surveillance camera, there's still not a warrant for her arrest at that time. Fugitive with a yoga mat. It was a yoga mat. She's carrying a yoga mat around. This is this is unbelievable. Caitlin Armstrong is wanted by authorities, has not been caught. Why not? How are they going to find her? Um, let me go through, uh, again, a little bit of where she has been spotted here. May 14th, 1230, okay, in the afternoon. Caitlin Armstrong is at the Austin International Bergstrom Airport, boarded a flight to Houston Hobby Airport, then boarded... A connecting flight to, I'll say it correctly, New York LaGuardia, okay, in Queens. May 18th, Armstrong, Caitlin Armstrong is dropped off at Newark Liberty International Airport. But a search of outbound flights at the Newark Airport revealed no reservations had been made under the name Caitlin Marie Armstrong. So where is she tonight? Why hasn't she been found? Still with us, former special agent in charge of the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, Shabora Randall, private investigator Jason Jensen, and joining us now in Long Island, New York, former commander with the United States Marshal Service, Lenny DePaul back with us. Great to see everyone. Great to see you, Lenny. Lenny, why has she been found? I mean, how could someone with a yoga mat be off the grid? That's the million-dollar question, Vinny. I mean, she's she's in the wind, like you said. She's a ghost. Uh, however, the U.S. Marshals, the Lone Star Fugitive Task Force in Texas, you know, it's a full court press right now. They elevated this thing to a major case. Uh, with that comes a ton of resources, money, state-of-the-art equipment, manpower. Uh, I think there's a $5,000 reward, and they're looking to increase that as well. And you know as well as I do, though, some people give up their best friend for five, ten thousand dollars 10000 streets talk. So, you know, she's uh, it's expected. She's gone dark. She's off the grid. Uh, my understanding, she's, she's got money. Uh, so she she's laying low right now. Is she being helped? Who knows? Does she have a burner phone? How's she communicating? You know, is was Newark International Airport on the 18th? Was that a diversionary tactic? Good possibility. I mean, she uh, wanted the investigators to think she zigged when uh, she thought she should have zagged. So, you know, they'll leave no stuns unturned. Uh, unturned uh, and also, they're looking at that digital footprint historically is important. Who does she communicate with? Uh, we call it who's who in the zoo, uh, you know, that trusted circle of friends. So they're looking at everybody trying to put that puzzle together and connect the, uh, connect the dots. So hopefully it's just a matter of time. Jason Jensen, your thoughts? I know you've been taking a close look at this one. Sure, sure. Thanks, Benny. Uh, well, typically when someone goes on the run, they're a fugitive. They look either go to a place that they're familiar with because they believe they can blend in, or they may turn to a family member where they can, you know, get some trusted assistance. In this particular situation with Caitlin, I believe she's traveling under the name of her sister, Christine. And interestingly enough, when I looked up Christine's background, I see an address that pops up for Christine in the New York, uh, uh, state of New York in uh, Livingston Manor area. So I would definitely say look for her in that area. Trabor? Can you put pressure on the family? Can you tap their phones? I mean, I, I, again, I watch all these shows all the time, right? There's someone in the wind. Everybody's phone is tapped, right? So you make a call, and somebody's in the, in the van down the corner listening to everything. Does that really happen when you're searching for someone? Actually, Vinny, it's not even as that complicated. That's the old-fashioned way we used to do it kind of back in the days. But, um, you know, he, he laid it out perfectly when we talk about the technology that we use, when we talk about the individual laying low, more than likely that's exactly what's going on. Uh, she's just laying low at this point. When she surfaces, there are certain behavioral things that we do uh, as human beings every day, whether you're a fugitive or not. And you're just going to revert back to that. And that's certainly when she'll be picked up, uh, you know, again on our radar, if you will. But we have to remember one thing when she first left. Uh, there was not an outstanding warrant at the time. Um, we know that she was able to 
uh, leave jail because there was an issue with a date of birth on a warrant that that she had, maybe a misdemeanor warrant that was there. So actually, you know, uh, somewhat to her credit, she wasn't necessarily on the run as someone that had been charged. Obviously, um, I feel that there was enough evidence or investigators wouldn't have charged her. So certainly I feel like she is most likely the person responsible for, for our victim's death. So of course she is a fugitive from justice, but the way she was able to just walk out of jail and basically uh, leave town, you know, was basically uh, to, to her credit at that time. She didn't have to work very hard and she will surface. Uh, it is very hard not to leave that, that digital footprint as he mentioned and also things we do behaviorally, whether you have, uh, you go through five different telephones, I'll just stop at that. There are certain things that we can pick up on. So I think it's just a matter of time before she's caught. All right, we've got the number up on the screen. If you see her, we're gonna talk more about this. Our guest staying with us, plus still ahead next hour. And tonight we break down the latest in Florida versus Danielle Redlick. A man marries his stepdaughter, then he ends up dead, and she is charged with his murder. Today, the jury hears from their child. We have a report from the courthouse. Here in downtown Orlando, the 18-year-old daughter of the defendant and the victim in this case takes the stand, making it very clear whose side she's on.
you can't imagine the pain that the Wilson family is going through. Our hearts go out to them. We would like to be left to be able to focus on Caitlin's safety and proving her innocence. That's Caitlin's dad, Mike Armstrong, talking about his daughter and she doesn't have to prove her innocence. She's presumed innocent. That's the way our system works. But right now she's a fugitive from justice because she has outstanding charges down in Texas for murder. Now she'll be presumed innocent in the courtroom, but first she's got to show up. And the fact that she has fled can and likely will be used against her during that trial as consciousness of guilt. Um, let me show you uh, from the affidavit of probable cause. This is interesting, and, and Trabor Randall spoke about this. It was discovered by officers that Armstrong had an outstanding Class B warrant for her arrest. During her interview, it was relayed to, the, to Detective Connor that the Class B warrant was not valid and she was free to leave. So that's why she was able to leave. This is what's really interesting. What was the Class B misdemeanor? Theft of services. On 3-6-2018, Armstrong intentionally secured the performance of a Botox treatment valued at $653. After the procedure was completed, Armstrong presented a MasterCard with her name on it at the point of sale. Before the card could be run for payment, Armstrong stated she didn't want to use the card but had another card in her vehicle she preferred to use. Armstrong left the card on the counter, walked out of the place, and did not return to pay. There you go. Let's bring back in our guest, Trabor Randall, Jason Jensen, Lenny DePaul, former commander, U.S. Marshal Service. Lenny, um, is she covering up that Botox with one of these masks now, you think, and kind of blending in in New York? Because, you know, a lot of folks in New York still wearing the masks, whether they're out on the streets or indoors, wherever they are. A lot easier to hide, um, you know, without having the Botox completely exposed. Anything's possible, Vinny. I mean, she could be hiding in plain sight, but, uh, you know, I think she's going to slip up. I mean, she's been dropping breadcrumbs her first two weeks out there. I mean, they got her in Houston jumping over uh, to LaGuardia, and then on the 18th, she's, you know, she's confirmed that, uh, you know, in Newark. I mean, did she get out of the country? That's anyone's guess. Um, the appropriate lookouts, I'm sure, are in place. I know the U.S. Marshals did uh, get that UFAP warrant, the unlawful flight to avoid prosecution, which gives, gives them a little more leverage on the federal side. Uh, but she'll, she'll slip up. Social media is fired up. Her picture's plastered everywhere. Uh, the public hopefully remains vigilant. And if they see her, um, you know, make that, make that phone call. But uh, she's the one sleeping with one eye open, uh, not the investigator. Well, it, it also could be that third eye that is open because she's walking around the yoga mat, Jason. She's got the yoga mat, Botox. And she was living a very, you know, a nice life, a very comfortable life. I don't know if you can live that life on the lamb. No, no, she really screwed up her life at this point. I mean, if she's responsible for a murder, she'll never have that lifestyle that she enjoyed before. So, yeah, going through the airport, walking around with a yoga mat, it looks like she's, you know, just every day average Joe just walking through the airport. It looks very innocent. But uh, nowadays with her face out there everywhere, certainly people are looking for her. Yeah. Uh, Trabor, um, where do you think the break comes from? I mean... It just seems like the life she was living very, seems like she has a great family, great support. Um, I can't imagine that she's just out there on her own. You know, first of all, you all have mentioned, you know, echoed over and over again the life that she had previously. And what's unfortunate, we've seen this any number of times where uh, these domestic situations, if you will, where someone who is uh, willing to throw their life away for the sake of an individual who who's going to walk around a free individual, free to pursue other love interests. Um, and, you know, this person may, you know, whether sometimes they end up taking their own lives but certainly it's going to spend a lot of time in prison. It's just really unfortunate. Yeah, hopefully no one takes their own life. Trabor Randall, Jason Jensen, Lenny DePaul. So great to have you on the show tonight. Appreciate it. We'll see you again real, real soon. When we come back, folks, Amber Heard talking about the jury next.
York, New York, Amber Heard sits down for her first interview since losing her trial to Johnny Depp. In part of that interview released today, Amber Heard talks about the jury who didn't believe her when she testified. And I thought he was punching me. I felt this pressure. I felt this pressure. Tonight, we take a look at Amber's reaction to the jury who awarded Johnny Depp $15 million. And tonight, we break down the latest in Florida versus Danielle Redlick. A man marries his stepdaughter, then he ends up dead, and she is charged with his murder. Today, the jury hears from their child. We have a report from the courthouse. Here in downtown Orlando, the 18-year-old daughter of the defendant and the victim in this case takes the stand, making it very clear whose side she's on. On the docket tonight in Broward County, Florida, the Parkland school shooter getting ready to face a jury who will decide if he lives or dies. Can he get a fair trial after the recent school shootings in Texas? I knew he wasn't okay when he punched the window in and said, I'm going to cause karma one day. Plus, Amber Heard also speaking out today about not being treated fairly by social media. Tonight's 13th juror social media question. Do you think Amber was treated fairly by social media? Get ready. This hour of Closing Arguments starts right now. I'm Vinny Politan. Great to have you with us here on Closing Arguments. Um, this hour, we're going to talk a lot about uh, Amber Heard speaking out for the first time. We got a, a few little pieces of, of what she is saying. Um, and it's fascinating, right? I mean, she, she went through the trial. She testified for days, cross-examination. We're going to talk about the social media reaction and all of that. Uh, but first, for those of you who don't recall what happened in Virginia, take a look. Ms. Heard made a some quite heinous and um, uh, disturbing, uh, brought these disturbing criminal um, acts um, against uh, me that, uh, that were not based in any species of truth, but never did I myself reach the point of um, uh, striking Miss Heard in any way, nor have I ever struck uh, um, any woman. What have you lost as a result of Miss Heard making these allegations against you? Nothing less than everything. It, it never had to go in this direction. And so I... I can't say that I'm embarrassed because I know that I'm doing the right thing. I st struggle to have the words. I struggle to find the words to describe how uh, painful this is. Um, this is horrible. This has been one of the, this is the most painful and difficult thing I've ever gone through. You know, we were together for five years, almost four and a half, and uh, it was a very violent, chaotic at times very loving, emotional uh, uh, relationship. So as, as anyone can imagine, there was a lot going on and uh, unfortunately the violence became almost normal. Every single day I have to relive the trauma. My hands shake, I wake up screaming. I, I have to live with the trauma and the damage done to me. This is horrible. This is painful. And this is humiliating for any human being to go through. And perhaps it's easy to forget that, but I'm a human being. And even though Johnny promised that I deserve this and promised he'd do this, I don't deserve this. I want to move on. As against Amber Heard, we, the jury, award compensatory damages in the amount of $10 million. As against Amber Heard, we, the jury, 
award punitive damages in the amount of $5 million. As against John C. Depp II, we, the jury, award compensatory damages in the amount of $2 million. As against John C. Depp II, we, the jury, award punitive damages in the amount of $0. So now Amber Heard is speaking on camera for the first time since losing that defamation trial against her ex, Johnny Depp. Um, she spoke to NBC's Savannah Guthrie saying that she doesn't blame the jury for ruling against her considering the testimony. There's no polite way to say it. The jury looked at the evidence you presented. They listened to your testimony and they did not believe you. They thought you were lying. How could, I'll put it this way, how could they make a judgment? How could they not come to that conclusion? They had sat in those seats and heard th over three weeks of nonstop, relentless testimony from paid employees and towards the end of the trial, randos, <laughs> as I say. I think she's missing the boat here. I mean, and the question was, they didn't believe you. That's what Savannah asked. Court TV, Court TV alum, Savannah Guthrie, by the way. Um, they didn't believe her. And then she twisted it and turned it on like, well, why would they believe? I mean, there's just all these people that came in and testified. I mean, she testified for days, told her story. They didn't believe it, but she didn't address it. I want to get some reaction from our think tank tonight. Joining us in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor Al Wunsch III, in Puerto Plata, in the Dominican Republic, criminal defense attorney and international man of mystery, Darnell Crossland is with us. And in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, family law attorney, Jennifer Brandt. Great to see everyone. Um, Al, what's going on here with Amber Heard? She does the interview and, and you know, we haven't seen the whole thing yet. We're just releasing little pieces at a time, right? That's what they're doing. Um, but she was asked, you know, why didn't they believe you? And again, she didn't really answer that question. She tried to blame it on, you know, all these paid witnesses of Johnny Depp's, people on his payroll. She testified for days, Al, for days. They didn't buy it. True. True. But, Ben, she's getting publicity. She's getting a chance to talk. She's getting a chance to be seen. She's getting a chance to put her face in front of the camera. She's getting a chance to find other work. She's getting a chance to be able to work so that she can pay off this uh, judgment against her. So how does she lose? She is back in front of the camera doing what she wants to do. She's giving her story. She's giving what happened. She's blaming social media. She's blaming this. She's blaming that. She's blaming everyone but herself. Okay, but the bottom line is, Vince, she's got the publicity she's craving. You know, the, the one thing about this story, though, that always was most tragic to me was that she didn't bring this suit. Okay, this was not her doing. She did not institute the suit. And I do think that, that the press has been kind of cruel that they don't point that out as much as they should. They just point out that she lost. But, you know, she did not need to be there. And, you know, now's her chance to kind of get out there and say, listen, you know what? Look, folks, it's done. I don't know why it happened the way it did. My life's been turned upside down. But you know what? You're not beating me, Johnny. I'm still here. Yeah, but Darnell, uh, I... You know, the question, from my perspective, was, was pretty simple, right? It was like, why, did, why didn't they believe you? And it, it, was, it had, again, she took no responsibility for it, just like her testimony. It's always somebody else. No responsibility for anything, including like, hey, well, I, I guess I just don't come across as a credible witness. I, you know, they didn't believe me. Um, or, but again, she just spun it and turned it on to something nefarious like like a bunch of Johnny Depp's friends coming into court and committing perjury. That's basically what she said there, right? They're all she paid. Uh, and, and by the way, when you, when you do that, are you committing uh, a defamation? Uh, no, no. I mean, that's typically what lawyers do anyway. We challenge 
all expert but, witnesses. But, but, but wait stayed. a minute, wait a minute. Amber Heard just said, it seems to me, <laughs> that the witnesses for Johnny Depp who paraded in there on his payroll, all right, we can talk about the bodyguards, we can talk about the people who got uh, free room and board, et cetera, including his sister, came in there and, and basically lied. Yeah, she, she has a prerogative. She, she has to do that. That's what you do. You attack everyone who so takes the So when you stand. lose a defamation case, you start defaming people? Like, what is this? That's like losing um, a murder trial and killing people, right? I mean, it's the same. Why, why is she doing this? Well, what she should have done, quite frankly, is to be uh, straightforward with this jury and, and with the public from this point on. What she should have said was that this was her truth, that she believes that she had no choice but to tell her truth, that the case was brought against her. Um, what I am still wondering, um, as Al pointed out, they must have had a bunch of pretrial conferences leading up to um, this lawsuit. And in those pretrial conferences, the judge and the courts are giving you so many opportunities to try to settle this matter, to try to work it out. So she could have said, I'm going to retract my statement. Um, she could have did a million things before we end up having to take it to a jury. So I think she doubled down on this. So, you, so to Al's point, even though she didn't bring the lawsuit, I think she certainly doubled down because she could have probably agreed to retract the statements and met somewhere in the middle. And she didn't do that. And now she's doubling down again, saying that he was a better actor than her. He had better um, witnesses than she did. And so she, she needs to give, give it up. Yeah, and it seems to me that Jennifer Brandt, Darnell just brought up another great point. He's a better actor than, than she, she made that statement as well. Well, if he's a better actor, are you saying that he was acting, that he was faking, that he was lying, that he really abused you? I mean, again, is, 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 is there more defamation taking place? That's why I don't know. Every time she speaks, it's, it's like if, if we take the jury's verdict for what it's worth, right? It's, it's the jury's verdict. They said it didn't happen. They said you lied about it. And then you, you, the doubling down is, to me, is just the doubling down on defamation. I don't know about that, Vinny. I don't agree with you there. I, wait, 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 wait. After you lose a def wait, wait, wait. Oh, After wait, you wait, lose no, a maybe. defamation case, are you allowed to repeat the defamatory allegations? After you lose? Isn't that what that Look. whole trial was about? She believes her story. She. What is she going to it say? It doesn't now? matter oh, what she believes, there, does it? It's what I, the jury I said. Lied. I didn't tell the truth. No, it doesn't. In her mind, she still feels that her. She told her truth. This is what she believes. Just because the jury made a decision, somebody's going to win. Somebody's going to lose. She lost. That doesn't mean that she says, "Oh, by the way, I just made this all up. I was lying the whole no, time." No, you I stop mean, talking. Vinny, what is she going to say? No, she has to talk. I agree. Wait, with Al. this is she crazy. Has to talk, is this crazy town? She's an, she's I feel like I'm in crazy she's town an tonight. <laughs> The Vinny, whole trial. Wait. She needs to rehabilitate her image. She needs to get out there. She needs work. She's not a civilian that's just going to go back and do their job. She's out in the public I, spotlight. She doesn't try to rehabilitate her I image. I fully appreciate She's that. Finished. I fully appreciate what, that. What else would I she do? I have no do? problem with her say, working. Oh, I, I wasn't being honest. I, I made this all up. She has to. She has to defend her position. And to Darnell's point. I don't think she could have settled this case because I think Johnny Depp had an ax to grind. He wanted to prove that she defamed him and he wasn't going to just settle this because the statements were still out there and he needed to clear his image. So I think, I don't think as much as she may have wanted to settle and who knows if she did or she didn't, I don't think that was going to be possible. I think Johnny said, look, I want to clear things up here. I want to get back to my work. I want to rehabilitate my image and he did a very good job of, of doing that through this trial right okay al let me ask you because i feel like i'm in crazy town here um <laughs> and not because the guests are crazy but because of how, the way this is playing out like we keep talking about his truth and her truth we had a trial doesn't the jury tell us the truth after a trial? Isn't that what a trial is? Like I always say, a search for the truth. They tell us at the end of the case. So if they tell us the truth is, Amber, you defamed Johnny Depp when you said he abused you. Doesn't, doesn't that, shouldn't that keep her from uh, repeating statements along those lines? Doesn't that prevent her from saying that, oh, 
Johnny Depp was acting on the witness stand, meaning he was lying and his friends were lying and, and I'm really a victim. Like you're not entitled to your truth after the jury tells us what the wait truth minute, is wait, in a Vinnie, defamation I case. Something. I gotta say something, Vinny. If you, you're talking about murder trials, somebody gets convicted of murder, right? They say they didn't do it. The jury finds that they convicted of the murder. How many people in jail say, oh, you know what, but this jury found that I was guilty. I did murder that person. They're going to say, no, I never did but it. But this and is they, a defamation on case. And on and on. It's not a, well, it but it's a defamation. It's about what you're saying about someone else. That, that our, our, law, matter, our law says that you're not allowed to defame people. So if the jury just found that you defamed someone, why is she allowed to go around, Al, and continue to make these statements? Well, because, Vin, the case isn't over. She can appeal. Okay, and so if there is an appeal filed, and if she should tragically die, okay, then what happens with regards to the verdict? In a criminal case, it's wiped away, that her conviction would be, would be gone, okay? It's not the same in a civil, but the point is, is that she still has the right to be saying that she feels the verdict was against the weight of the evidence. But she's taking and it so beyond that. She she's taking it beyond no, but, that. But, she's but, but accusing minute, people of minute, lying wait. on a witness stand. But, but, but Vinny, just remember, there was a very, very wise man who once said, and his name was George Costanza, it's not a lie if you believe it. But okay? it is. So the jury no, just told me, what was the point of that? those seven weeks of trial, Darnell? Darnell, if the you can get me out of crazy is, town just, tonight, I'll appreciate the, the, it, no, Darnell. No. I, I, the, 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 I, I, have, I have a one-way ticket here on crazy town. The bottom line is, is this. <laughs> the Johnny Depp character he played was more popular than the character she played. And the bottom line was, is I don't care, he went up there, he put on his charm, he put on his three best characters, okay, and he won. That's what happened. If that was the real Johnny Depp, then the man is just bizarre. So, but that's Vinny, I gotta get you out. I'm, 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 get me out not, of crazy town yeah, here. I'm, 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 I'm taking you out of crazy town. So you're absolutely right. And, and I heard some of your earlier episodes where you kind of made up your own redefaming re um, phrase. Redefamation, yeah, it's a new tour. Redefamation. Yes, and I feel that you are onto something because the idea is if you communicate to two or more people to the detriment of someone else, a statement that's not true, then you're gonna be liable for defamation. And it feels as though she's saying to two or more people every single day that Johnny Depp beat her, he abused her, and, and that's, what you, that's what you're saying. So I think you are right to feel that you're in crazy town. And some courts have gone as far as to enter a gag order or to say that you're gonna be fined if you continue this behavior. So his lawyers might be right for making a motion at this point, saying that we want a motion to stop her from continuing to do this. That doesn't mean she can't appeal, but that's a legal argument. You gotta stop talking, just file your motions yeah. and, and argue what it, went wrong. So, so that's so the best I can do to get you out of time. Stay? You're, you're gonna stay freedom of speech? It's not. No, but you. Wait, You're defamation not is not part of freedom of speech. It's called defamation exactly. for a reason. Al, okay. It's definition. Everyone's staying with us when we come back. <laughs> Hopefully, Crazy we're cat. back on track. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't understand this. I, we haven't covered a defamation trial before, but at some point, you have to stop defaming the guy. I think. When we come back, um, the trial we're covering live case on Court TV. It's a murder trial. The victim, the stepdaughter of, no, the stepfather of the defendant, but also the husband. Details, next. It is further directed that any evidence or property seized under this warrant shall be brought before a court and on proper jurisdiction to be disposed of. I did not murder my husband. Please, I don't understand the department.
you will learn throughout the course of this case is that Ms. Redlich makes many, many statements concerning the circumstances of Michael's death. I believe my husband is deceased. I, I just, he's stiff and he's wounded. He might have had a heart attack. I don't know. Did you just find him? No, actually, it happened last night. He was not okay last night. We had, we had altercation and he stabbed himself and I ran into the bathroom and then when I came out, I tried to help him and I thought he was just lying in blood. Yes, Danielle was confused and she was panicked and she reacted in that confusion and panic. The question that you will need to answer at the end of this trial is, at the time that Danielle Redlick stabbed Michael Redlick, was that done in self-defense? Welcome back. There are uh, two things that I think are, are, are really unusual about this case. And, and the first is the, the phone calls, the 911 calls, everything else. Danielle Redlick is at home with her husband. He's dead. She waits 11 hours to call 911. Like after 11 hours, do you even call 911 or do you call like the non-emergency number? Like that, to me, that's bizarre. And, and I think that's a, a fact that can be used against her. But then all these different stories, it's a heart attack, he was stabbing himself. Oh no, no, now we're at trial and it's self-defense. And it may very well be true, but it's, it's a bizarre part of this case. The other bizarre part is the relationship and how it all started. I mean, Michael Redlick was married to Danielle's mother. Her mother passes away. Danielle ends up with her stepfather, becomes her husband. But it's not like it, it happens quickly and then after like a year, things get really strange. No, they have like a real relationship, a real life together. They raise children together. So, you know, there's an age difference, okay. But everything else is like, seems relatively normal despite the fact that he's her stepfather and husband at the same time. Anyhow, they did have a family. I feel so bad for the kids here. Dad is dead, mom is charged with the murder, and now they've gotta testify. Their daughter took the stand today. Cameras, microphones, couldn't show it. But Court TV legal correspondent Julie Janae in the courtroom watching it all and reporting on it for us tonight. The prosecution ended their day with one of the most compelling witnesses of this trial so far, and that was Jaden, the 18-year-old daughter of the victim, Michael Redlick, and the daughter of the defendant, Danielle Redlick. She showed so much poise and strength on the stand. She kept her composure and her eye contact, or the lack thereof, it spoke volumes. Her body was completely turned towards the jury when she described her late father, Michael Redlick. And she said this on direct examination, my dad Dad and I were very close. We practically did everything together. He took me out on daddy-daughter dates all the time. We were very close. I told him everything. And she was asked, what was your relationship like with your mother? This moment sent a slice through the courtroom. She said very toxic, very manipulative. The defense attorney tried to diffuse this, objecting, saying that it was argumentative, but that was overruled. She also said that her parents' relationship was rocky and it was tumultuous and that her mother was the person who prompted a lot of the problems between her parents and her ire for her mother really was on display most clearly outside the presence of the jury during a long sidebar Danielle Redlick at that moment descended into tears she was sobbing loudly after she heard her daughter describe her essentially as toxic Jaden was refusing to look her mother's way even using her hand to block her gaze so that she wouldn't have to look at her in that moment which was a housekeeping moment inside of the courtroom, 
prosecutor Sean Wiggins steps in very calmly and blocks the view from the defense table to the witness stand, making sure that Jaden would not have to look at her in that emotional moment, uh, really shielding this young witness. And he ended his direct examination with this, saying, did you ask her what happened to your father? And she said, I remember her exact words to me, where the autopsy said he had a heart attack. This was a mic drop moment inside of that courtroom. The defense highlighted in their cross-examination what happened the day before. This was January 10th, asking if he was drinking, if he seemed visibly angry. And Jaden did agree that her father did seem angry, that he apologized later that night, and that she threw away a liquor bottle that she saw him with, trying to calm things down between her parents. It was a very quick cross-examination, and she was ushered out of that courtroom. We expect that the state is going to be resting very soon, followed by the possibility of Danielle Redlick taking the stand in her own defense. Reporting in downtown Orlando, Julia Janae with Court TV. Our thanks to Julia Janae doing amazing work down there in Orlando. Um, you know, most trials I've covered where one spouse is accused of, of killing the other, the, the children, whether they're young or adult children, will 99 times out of 100 be on the side of the surviving parent because they don't want to believe it. This case is different, though, because it's a self-defense case. So you've got to choose sides. You've got to choose sides. And I think the jury will pick up on this big time. Let's bring back in our think tank, Al Wunsch, Darnell Crossland, Jennifer Brandt. Darnell, your thoughts about those little messages that could be sent to this jury just by the daughter's body language in that courtroom? Well, let me start by saying the only person who would know the non-emergency number for any police department would be Al Wunsch III. Um, secondly, um, I do not like the uh, opening argument that the defense attorney um, presented when she said the only question that the jury is going to have to answer at the end of this trial is whether, in fact, she stabbed um, the victim in self-defense. She should be telling them that they stabbed them and she stabbed them in self-defense, not asking and leaving it open for a whole journey. She should tell them right off the bat. Now, in terms of the uh, communications from the children, I never like when they put children in, in, in the middle of these things. Um, I don't know if the prosecution even had to go there. I think that was an unfair advantage. I'm not sure how they prepped this um, child. Um, and, and it's just, I never like when that happens. But I do believe that the... Uh, if this is a credibility issue, uh, those children are going to speak volumes to this jury in terms of who's more credible out of the mom or the dad. So I can't wait for them to build up the her psychological problem because that's what really what we need to be talking about, not really credibility. Jennifer Brand, family law attorney, uh, you're in the middle of this all the time, right? So from your from your experience, not murder, not murder, not murder. I'm talking about domestic. <laughs> divorces, kids in the middle of whatever's going, uh, happening between mom and dad. From your experience, do kids sort of lean towards the person who is in the right, right? There's a relationship that's breaking up. Maybe somebody's not acting appropriately. Someone's in the wrong, someone's in the right. Do the kids, do they get the feeling, do they usually get it right, do you think? You know, Vinny, typically kids really don't want to be in the middle of it at all. And they tend to be more neutral. You know, you never, I always tell clients, don't ever rely on your children to make your case for you because it's not going to happen. When kids get into court, they tend to sort of say all the good things about mom, all the good things about dad, and they don't want to be the one choosing sides. So here it's interesting. This this child, I, I don't know, I think she's 18. So 18 she's almost now, adult. yes. 18 now. Yeah. It's still a child, she, though, in my eyes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she is, though, clearly, you know, showing that she had not a good relationship with her mother. She's definitely in favor of her father, you know, sad about his death. It was very close to him, obviously. I mean, I think it, it tells a lot about, you know, that maybe the mother had certain issues, for sure. I don't know how helpful it is in this murder though and, and in this particular situation in terms of self-defense this young woman was not there at the time did not observe what went on between the parents only knew that there had been some chaos in the household um prior to this event so 
I don't know how much she furthers the case on either side, but certainly uh, it shows that she she definitely had a, a bad relationship with mom and that maybe mom does have some psychological issues. So I don't know if that's helpful or hurtful, but um, yeah, I, you know, I don't think she really furthered the, the case too much. Al, how about the big fat lie that was told by Danielle Redlick to her daughter about how her father died? I mean, is that going to be held against her because she's saying... Uh, autopsy says heart attack. They, I mean, come on. They, the autopsy didn't say that. She's lying. Now she's saying self-defense, telling her daughter heart attack, telling 911 heart attack. Maybe he was stabbing himself. Uh, but again, all that's 11 hours later. Right. Well, uh, first off, 201-569-8300. Angle <laughs> Cliff's direct police number. Um, <clears throat> secondly, with regards to the <laughs> lie, I think that it can be diffused by saying, listen, you know what? I didn't want to tell you exactly what happened. And I just figured I would make it easier just saying he had a heart attack, as opposed to telling you the truth that your father was trying to kill me and I had to kill him. So, I, I, you know, I think it can be diffused that way. I'm not saying that the jury's going to buy that, but, you know, I, you might not want to tell the truth to your, like you said, your 18 year old child. And you've said child, Benny. So it's like, you know, you're treating her as she's being, you know, she's a young kid. And you may she not want to say dad, dad died because I killed her. Not well, that's true. But what yeah. I'm saying is, is that dad, dad was killed by me because he was trying to kill me. That's what she would have. Would you say that to your daughter or just say that the autopsy said a, a heart attack? I, I just hope it's this just situation easier. never comes up, Al. Would I say that to my daughter? No, I <laughs> I don't, I don't want that situation to come up, but I know it's difficult. I, I if, she was, if she was the victim of Michael Redlick, it was a difficult spot to be in. So I get what you're saying now. Uh, that's why we have these, these folks on every week, folks. This is why we bring in Al Wunsch, Darnell Crossland, Jennifer Brandt. They do the work day in and day out. When we come back, we're going to take you on the docket, um, getting ready for the Parkland School shooter. He's already pleaded guilty to 17 murders, 17 attempted murders. But the jury's got to make a big, big decision. Life or death for the shooter.
www.ucl.edu. On the docket tonight, the Parkland School shooting. Now, the shooter has already pleaded guilty to 17 murders. A jury will decide life or death or in the midst of this jury selection. But I want to take you back uh, to the moment that the shooter uh, was pleading guilty and speaking out in court. Take a listen. I am very sorry for what I did, and I have to live with it every day. And that if I were to get a second chance, I would do everything in my power to try to help others. And I am doing this for you, and I do not care if you do not believe me. And I love you, and I know you don't believe me, but I have to live with this every day. And it brings me nightmares, and I can't live with myself sometimes. But I try to push through, because I know that's what you guys would want me to do. I hate drugs, and I believe this country would do better if everyone would stop smoking marijuana and doing all these drugs and causing racism and violence out in the streets. I'm sorry, and I can't even watch TV anymore. And I'm trying my best to maintain my composure, and I just want you to know I'm really sorry. And I hope you give me a chance to try to help others. If, you, if I believe it's your decision to decide where I go and whether I live or die, not the jury's. I believe it's your decision. I'm sorry. So this case has been moving along with uh, a jury selection and, and a lot of issues have come up. One of the issues that came up that the defense was very concerned about was whether or not the Parkland school shooter is going to get a fair trial during the penalty phase of his case after the school shooting in Texas. Let's bring back in the think tank Al Wunsch, Darnell Crossland, Jennifer Brandt. Um, Jennifer, I'll start with you. Your thoughts about the impact that the shooting in Texas could potentially have on this case? Do you think it's a real issue, a real concern, or it's just, you know, the defense doing what the defense does, which is, you know, raise issues along the way? I don't see how, I mean, this case is so horrific in of itself that I don't think that the other school shooting is gonna have any greater impact. I mean, what he did and what he, he you know, all these people that were affected by his actions, I think that is just terrible. And I don't think that it's going to matter that there was another school. I mean, it's tragic that there was another school shooting, don't get me wrong. But in terms of this case and whether it makes it prejudicial for him or anything like that, I, I can't say it. I know the defense is raising that, but I I don't see how, uh, you know, the how it's going to change anything in this case. This case needs to be moved along. Um, it's been a lot of time, all these, you know, victims, all these people that have been impacted by this, this has to go forward. And I don't think the fact that there was another school shooting is going to have any change in, in what happens in the outcome of this case. Al, do you think this at all impacts the shooter's right to a fair trial during his penalty phase when the jury is deciding whether he lives or dies? The fact that there was this other very, very tragic, high-profile school shooting. It has to be looked into. It would have to be voir dire. It would have to be brought up to the jury. It would have to be examined. Um, but, you know, the, the defendant here has done the, the Leopold and Loeb lob by saying, look, you know, I'm guilty. I did this. But, you know, now he's trying to sincerely take responsibility. And that a lot of times will diffuse hostility. And it makes it different than other cases. He's coming in and saying, I did this, and I'm wrong, and I want a second chance. And, you know, I'm, I know Darnell's favorite movie is, is uh, West Side Story. And, you know, that's the Officer Crumpke defense, okay? And you have a situation that you say that, you know, I'm sick. I'm, I blame it on this, blame it on that. He's already set it up by saying, blame it on drugs, blame it on social uh, media. Blame it on what's going on in this world. How could I be normal? And give me a chance to try to find that normality. Smart move. Darnell, Al used up a lot of time there, so you have about 20 seconds. Go ahead. Uh, Uvalde is definitely going to have an impact on the jurors' consciousness, on the country's consciousness. After listening to Matthew McConaughey speak at the White House, um, this is going to be weighing heavy on everyone's consciousness. Um, I do think that the, they should raise it, 
but it should not be a determining factor. They have to move forward. All right, folks, when we come back, time to hear from you, our 13th juror, because Amber Heard speaking out for the first time. We're hearing a couple little pieces of the interview that will be played in its entirety later this week. Um, Amber Heard saying she wasn't treated fairly on social media. So I asked you, on social media, was Amber Heard treated fairly on social media? Your verdict next. <laughs> from Omaha Steaks.
to be at least a dollar for compensatory damages and up to whatever you feel the damages should be. They found someone. They just didn't put the amount. But someone, someone got defamation. Oh my God, guys. In about five minutes is the verdict. I'm going to throw up. Here we go. The moment of truth. Question. The statement was false. Answer, yes. Yeah. Due to circumstances surrounding the publication of the statement, it conveyed a defamatory implication to someone who saw it other than Mr. Depp. Answer, yes. Oh, my God. At least Amber looks nervous, like, for real. She's a very bad actress. We love you, Johnny. We love you. Hey, jo Johnny. Johnny, Johnny, I love you, bro. We do find that the jury's verdict is unanimous. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes your service in this case. Just a small snippet of the online reaction to the verdict in Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard, and that outpouring of support for Johnny Depp is really a representation of how the public and social media felt throughout the whole trial. Well, now Amber Heard is finally speaking out. The actrix, actress spoke to NBC's Savannah Guthrie about what she describes uh, was unfair social media representation. I don't care what one thinks about me um, or what judgments you want to make about what happened in the privacy of my own home and my marriage behind closed doors. I, I don't presume the average person should know those things, and so I don't take it personally. But even somebody who is sure I'm deserving of all this hate and vitriol, even if you think that I'm lying, you still couldn't look me in the eye and tell me that you think on social media there's been a fair representation. You cannot tell me that you think that this has been fair. So I asked you on social media, of course, did social media treat Amber Heard fairly? We begin with our 13th juror comment of the day coming from Lisa who says, Amber Heard was treated fairly. Most people thought going in she was a domestic abuse survivor, but now she's looked at as a domestic abuse faker. That's on her because of her lies. She really is lucky to be giving interviews instead of being in jail for perjury. Darnell Crossland, um, do you think people are looking at her right now as a domestic abuse faker? Absolutely, 100%. And she keeps saying that social media didn't represent fairly. They didn't represent anyone. They they weren't hired by any of any of the people in this trial. So it's bizarre to hear her keep saying that. They did not represent either of the parties. So um yes, she's a faker. And that's how she's being viewed. David tonight, absolutely not. Her case was doomed from the start. She never had a chance. Way too many Johnny Depp lovers out there, I guess. Jennifer Brandt, this is what I found in this case. That, you know, in the beginning, right, when this thing broke back in 2016, I think it was Johnny Depp supporters, maybe some bots or something that were online making the noise. But once this trial hit and millions and millions and millions of people were watching, many of whom I don't think were Johnny Depp fans. I think they were just people watching a trial like people do every day on court TV and making a judgment on who they believed and who they didn't believe. I agree with you, and I, I don't think that anyone, Amber Heard included, has a right to be treated fairly on social media or not fairly. I mean, it's, that's not what it's all about. It's about people voicing their opinions. Like you said, people watching the trial and giving their reactions as to what they thought based on everything that they're seeing. So, I mean, it's really public reaction. That's what it's all about, and no one says that it necessarily has to be fair. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's ever fair. Uh, Reedy tonight. I think she was treated fairly. She was treated and judged by her actions and words on the stand. Isn't that really the bottom line to all of this, Al? That that is what people were reacting to. They reacted to her testimony, um, her direct, her emotions on the stand, um, the cross-examination, and they made a judgment. The naysayers nayed, then, and she didn't like it. But like Jennifer said, Social media doesn't have to be fair. It's not balanced. It's not advertising as such. It is people getting up there saying what they feel is 
the situation, their emotions, their feelings, their beliefs, and they're going forward. They turned it from social media to anti-social media against her. But you can bet your bottom dollar she'll be using social media herself at some point when the new uh, uh, Aquaman movie comes out shortly. And, and the bottom line here, let's not forget, the jury agreed. As a matter of fact, the jury was actually unanimous. Like, social media is not unanimous. You know, there's, she's got some supporters. It's a much smaller number. But the jury unanimously did not believe her. 7-0. Anyhow, what a great job tonight. Al Wunsch, Darnell Crossland, Jennifer Brandt, it's always great to have you in the program. Great way to start the week. We'll see you again really, really soon. When we come back, we are not done. We have a missing child. I have a photo I need to show you. You need to see it. We need to find this child.
Before we go tonight, I have a photo I need to show you. Please take a close look. This is Anaya McKnight, just 12 years old, missing out of Minneapolis, Minnesota since May 25th. If you see Anaya, please call 911, 1-800-THE-LOST, or you can call the Minneapolis Police Department. The number is on the screen. Let's see if we can get Anaya back to safety. That's it for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Vinny Politan. Have a great night. And as always, please don't forget to hug the kids. that I wasn't dreaming is that when he pulled my head up off the bed and he had the knife up under my neck. Then we hit the water. It was absolutely...